Hello, welcome to Anna Jo Explains. Um, and this is a continuation of the last video. Um, that hopefully is knocking your socks off. Um, the topic is about what things have in common. Um, taking off your socks and shoes, stretching and shifting shapes, um, solving for x in algebra 1, and the power rule in calculus. All of them really are, in my mind, related to taking off your socks and shoes by this one idea that we discussed in the last video, um, that to undo something, you do things, the opposite things in the opposite order. Um, the interesting part being this last bit, um, which whenever it shows up in geometry or in symbols, um, specifically the two examples we covered last time, um, it can be really awkward to think about doing the things in the opposite order. But whenever you think about it in a standard real life example, where in the morning you put on your socks and then your shoes, but at the end of the day you take off your shoes and then your socks, it makes more sense that you have to do the opposite things in the opposite order to undo things. And that's not um, like intrinsically numbers thing that happens. That's an intrinsically universal thing that happens. That's how undoing works. Um, and so after you understand that, these three things all kind of make more sense. Um, this being that showing up in geometry, where um, we covered how doing a shift and then stretching. Um, to undo that, you have to unstretch and then unshift. And if you do it the other order, where you unshift and then unstretch, you end up in a different place. Um, and in discussing that, we mentioned how when the order of undoing matters, the order of doing matters. Like these are the exact same problem. That sometimes doing things, the same two things in a different order gets you the, a different result. Um, and that's shifting followed by stretching. Um, if you shift and then stretch versus stretch and then shift, you end up with two different things. And the difference between them is directly related to the difference whenever you do the opposite things in the same order and you get something that you didn't start with. Um, all of that doesn't have to be understood precisely um, to understand what's about to happen. Because what's about to happen is in the same way that this was showing how you can apply those same sort of things to um, algebra and symbols in there, we're now going to apply it to symbols in calculus. And even if you don't know calculus, this can be useful to you. Um, because you can see how even in a situation you're unfamiliar with, holding on to something you're really familiar with is useful. Um, so without further ado, let's hop in. Um, I'm going to move over here, give you something to look at over here. Um, that stuff in mind. All right. All right. Yeah, this feels good. Um, OK. So the cover power rule. Um, I'm going to only cover what's necessary for this. So I'm going to use minimal symbols and minimal calculus. We're not even actually going to touch the calculus part. I'm just going to say things that you get to take for granted. Um, so in particular, um, we're going to take for granted what the power rule says in um, for derivatives in calculus. You don't have to know what a derivative is or what it represents. All you have to do is trust me that the instruction that teachers will tell you in calculus is that um, the, the power rule is that whenever you're handed f of x equals x to the n, they tell you that this f apostrophe of x, which is the derivative, represents the derivative of f, is going to be in x to the n minus 1. Uh, we'll frequent, or I'll say 
I'll, I'll describe that as the derivative of f throughout this, um, even though there are other nicknames for it you'll hear in a calculus class. Um, so this is normally what they just hand you. They'll say, there's your formula. Every time you see x to the n and you want to take its derivative, you get n x to the n minus 1. Um, and to be clear how this would, well, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> All right, um, so uh, a thing I want to make clear is normally they just hand you this formula and say use it, but I would like to have the formula in words as well. It's usually easier for people to remember if they both have it in symbols and as instructions. Um, and the instructions that this tells you to follow is first multiply by the exponent, the n. You multiply by n because that's what's in the exponent. Then, um, subtract 1 from the exponent. That's replacing n in the exponent with n minus 1. And if you do the things in that order, you get this result, um, which now whenever I phrase things like that, Maybe you can see how this is going to tie into our topic at hand. Um, and if you don't, hang on to your pants. We're going to get there. Um, so let's see this as an example um, before we get into the nitty gritty. Um, so for example, whenever you have Some old polynomial like f of x equals um, 4x cubed plus 8x squared minus 3x plus 4. Um, the derivative of that um, is going to be you do this term by term, and there are some other rules in calculus that let you do that. Um, but you just focus on the x cubed and you say, okay, for this term, um, I multiply by the exponent. So I get 4 times 3, 12. x to the lower the power by 1 is squared. Then on the next term, 8 times 2 is 16. Um, and then subtract 1 from the exponent to get 1, which I don't need to write. Um, in the same way as I didn't need to write the to the first power there, there's an invisible to the first power here, so I can treat the n as 1 on the 3x. Say I'm going to multiply negative 3 by 1 and get negative 3x to the subtract 1 from that 1 and get an exponent of 0. Um, there are other reasons I can discuss in a different video for why um, to the 0 power is always going to be 1, unless the x is 0, but we're not talking about that. Um, so anything to the 0 power is 1, so I don't need to write that. Um, in the same way as I didn't need to write that, there's an invisible x to the 0 here on that 4. And so whenever I'm thinking about that, the n is 0, so I multiply by the exponent, and it zeroes everything out. So this always zero for the constant part. And I don't need to write plus zero because anything plus zero is zero. And I'm done. Now that may be a lot if you just, if this is your first time seeing how this gets applied here. But I hope it's making it clear how you, there's a system, a pattern to it, and thinking through it in this step by step of multiply by the exponent, subtract one. Multiply by the exponent, subtract one. Can become just a pattern that you follow. Um, and it's almost easier to think about it this way than to think about it in these symbols. So the symbols are helpful. It's a concise way of writing it for sure. But here's where we connect it now to taking off your socks and shoes. Um, so 
I'm going to lead up into being able to undo a derivative, which is called doing an integral in calculus, but we don't care about that. Um, it's also called doing an antiderivative, and that's the word I'll use here because it'll make more sense even if you've not had calculus. So if we want to undo a derivative, we need to undo these steps, which means undo them in the opposite order. Um, just to be clear, um, we can check real fast if it's actually even necessary to do them in the opposite order by checking if doing the two things we have normally in the other order gets us something different. And sure enough, if instead we subtracted one from the exponent before we multiplied by the exponent, then instead of multiplying by n, we'd be multiplying by n minus 1. Uh, for example, down here, if instead of multiplying by 3 and getting 12, and then subtracting 1 and getting 2, if we subtracted first and got 2, and then multiplied by that 2, we get 4 times 2 is 8, and our answer would be smaller. And that would happen any time. If we subtracted first and then multiplied by that smaller number, we'd get a smaller result. And so doing these in the opposite order really does change the answer. So since doing the two things in different orders gets us different results, we do need to care about doing the opposite things in the opposite order when we take the antiderivative. So um, let's talk about that. So for antiderivatives, um, the concept of this is that we're being handed a function and being told that it's the derivative of something. What could it be the derivative of? So instead of being told f of x equals x to the n, we're told that f prime of x is x to the n. And we're trying to figure out what could have that as its derivative. And if we're going to follow the instructions in the opposite order, that means we need to undo subtract 1 from the exponent, and then undo multiply by the exponent. And you know your algebra of what undoing these things is like. Um, undoing subtraction is just addition. So I'll add 1 to the exponent. That's the from changing to a 2 is just English. It's not actually mathematically doing anything interesting. Um, the mathematically interesting part is subtraction. Undoing subtraction is addition. Um, similarly, undoing multiplication, well, that's division. So we divide by the exponent. All right. And so that means starting with x to the n, we replace n with n plus 1 to add 1 to that exponent. Then we divide by the exponent that we have. So we get 1 over that. Um, now, in case you're concerned about me not writing this, just know that anytime you're dividing by a number, that's the same as multiplying by the fraction. Just like how if you divide by 2, you get half of what you started with. So dividing by 2 and multiplying by half are the same thing. Same thing here. If I divide by n plus 1, that's the same as multiplying by 1 n plus 1. Um, so we have that. This is the formula that they would tell you. Um, typically, teachers don't go over these words. But again, like looking at these symbols, it can be hard to figure out how these symbols actually correspond. That if I were handed these, these would be the things that undo that. It's not obvious. It does work out. You can do the algebra and plug this into that, and it happens to do. But it's far more intuitive to me to remember for derivatives, you multiply by the exponent and subtract 1 from it. For antiderivatives, add 1 to the exponent, then divide by it. 
undo them in the opposite order. And then that should make this make sense. If I were handed this example f prime here and asked to find what could be the original function who got this derivative, um, I'd start with 12x squared. I'd add 1 to this 2 and divide by it. And 12 over 3 is 4x cubed. Okay, 16x uh, to the first, add 1 to that 1 and get 2, divide by it and get 8. 8x squared, done. Um, this has the invisible x to the 0, so I add 1 to the 0 and get 1, and then divide by that 1, doesn't change it, I get minus 3x. This plus 4 is the one part that's weird, and that one part that's weird is weird because, as we saw, it got completely obliterated by taking the derivative. So the information that 4 was here is kind of lost when taking the derivative. And so when taking the antiderivative, instead of getting plus 4 here, we get plus c. Any constant could have been there, and the derivative would have been the same. Um, that idea of lost information as you do something is um, something I will talk about in a different topic. But um, it is also an interesting thing that has a lot of uses in a wide variety of cases. Um, but here, this should hopefully make sense for everything up to the c. If you ignore that part, this is the important part we're talking about here. That if I knew how to take the derivative down, I also know how to undo it and go up, provided I undo the things in the opposite order. That's all there is to it. Um, yeah, I hope that this clarifies how these things are similar and how you can use that similarity of things to really like handle a lot of different situations. Um, yeah, there's, and I really appreciate it coming up in places like taking off your socks and shoes. Like, yes, I apply this all the time in my math work, but also like if I'm designing something or like trying to build a contraption um, or figure out what would be a good way for somebody to even like tidy up a, a, um, a, a drawer so that it's usable and reusable. Like making things reusable is, is a fundamentally a process of repeatedly doing and undoing. And so like keeping track of what it takes to undo things and how much effort that is, is kind of important throughout any design process. And being able to realize that the undoing process is backwards um, and have that be intuitive and on your fingertips can really expedite like making things and making things really useful and easy to you. Um, so there you have it. Ah, may this information serve you well. <laughs>